Sometimes at the beginning of a movie you see something like inspired by true events or based on a true story. Saying that artificial intelligence is like your brain is a lot like that. It starts with a few facts, but then the rest of the movie goes off in a different direction. Your brain is so different from AI that in this video I'll focus on three areas. Neural network neurons aren't like biological neurons. Artificial synapses are only a little like biological synapses. And backpropagation, the mainstay of AI learning, has no biological analog whatsoever. Of course, there is another branch of AI, symbolic AI, but it makes no pretense of being like your brain, so we'll bypass it for this conversation. The reason this is an important conversation is that in the search for artificial general intelligence, today's crop of AI applications show very little aptitude in areas where any three-year-old can excel. Things like common sense understanding of cause and effect or the passage of time or gravity or spatial relationships. We have an excellent example of general intelligence in the human brain. So like the Wright brothers who analyzed birds when designing the first airplane, let's compare the human brain's similarities and differences with today's AI. Neural networks are so different from the way your brain works, let's start with the lone similarity, the general concept. Both have things called neurons interconnected by weighted synapses, and the state of a neuron impacts the states of neurons to which it is connected. But there the similarity stops. Biological neurons don't appear in orderly layers with orderly connections between one layer and the next, like in neural network diagrams. Instead, your brain has a tangle of interconnections which we have yet to unravel. So let's start at the bottom with the biological neuron. Here's the briefest description of how a neuron works, receiving incoming spikes and then spiking itself. Computer models of biological neurons can be complex, but fortunately the simplest neuron model, integrate and fire, is sufficient to show the limited relationship with artificial neural networks. The biological neuron accumulates charge from incoming synapses and emits a spike when a threshold is reached. In this timing diagram, each spike of the upper neuron contributes to the charge of the lower neuron until the threshold is reached. Then the lower neuron emits a spike of its own and the process can repeat. In the simulator, here are a few neurons. We'll set the one labeled clock to spike as fast as it can. You can see the firing in the spiking timeline. Now we'll add a synapse from the clock neuron to the neuron labeled out. Initially, the weight of that synapse is one. So the out neuron fires whenever the clock neuron fires. Let's change the synapse weight to 0.5 and notice that the out neuron fires once every other clock spike. Now we'll set that synapse weight to 0.1 and you can see the internal charge or membrane potential of the neuron slowly increases until it reaches the red dash threshold, then the out neuron spikes and resets. Let's turn to the artificial neural network. If you're familiar with them, you've seen this picture numerous times. Here's the initial problem. The biological neuron is a spiking device which cannot and does not output an analog value like these axes. Instead, neuron values are binary. Either there is a spike or there is not. In a few cases, AI experts counter by saying, no problem, just set that activation function to a step function. 
but this ignores the accumulated charge from one cycle to the next, so we'd also need to add some internal memory not reflected in the neural network. Instead, most AI experts try to rectify things by saying that the X's aren't individual spikes, but represent the spiking rate of the neuron. The idea is that the rate could vary continuously. In practice, though, the spiking rate cannot vary continuously because the neurons have a maximum spiking rate of about 250 hertz, and neural signals cannot be useful below about 20 hertz, and in between, high noise levels in the brain limit the number of different rates which can be reliably represented. But I won't dwell on these practical problems and move on to an even more fundamental issue. Let's model just two neurons, again with one neuron firing at a rate of 1, connected by a synapse of weight 0.5 to the neuron out, which will then spike every other incoming spike for a rate of 0.5. The summation equation also says we should get 0.5 well and good. But let's change that synapse weight to 0.75. But look! The outspiking rate is still 0.5, while the summation equation says it should be 0.75. We can increase that synapse weight to 0.9, and the output spiking rate still doesn't change, until we actually raise it to 1. We can see that the biological spiking neuron simply doesn't match the neural network formula. This is because these pesky biological neurons are simply not linear devices. For another illustration, let's make things a bit more complex with two input neurons, A and B, connected to our out neuron, each with a spiking rate of 0.5, A is connected with a weight of 0.5, and B with a weight of 0.25. The out spike rate is shown and is 0.25. But let's change things so A and B neurons are no longer spiking simultaneously. The output spiking frequency becomes 0.33. Let me reiterate, if the signals are in phase, you get a spike rate of 0.25. If they're out of phase, you get a spike rate of 0.33. Hold on a minute, when we look at the formula, signal phase and timing are missing in action. But yet in the real world, phase and timing are important and can lead to different results. This gives the biological neuron a whole universe of potential functionality excluded from the neural network formula. And we haven't started in on that little sigmoid function on the right. It has no biological analog whatsoever. It was added there in the 1980s to make the backpropagation algorithm work to solve some specific problems. I'll get back to backpropagation in a moment. That is not to say that this is a bad formula. It just doesn't have much to do with biological neurons. Saying this weighted summation represents neurons is like saying a stopped clock represents time because it is correct twice a day. The neural network formula can sometimes match biological neurons, but not usually. Why? The underlying idea of having neurons with analog continuous values is invalid and excluding phase and timing eliminates lots of the neurons potential. Which brings us to synapses for a similar conversation. Once again, the neural network represents the weight of a synapse as a floating point number, although the neuroscientists tell us that synapses have a limited number of discrete values. But let's look at an even more fundamental problem. There is no way to access the weight of a synapse. Reconsider the example of a neuron firing at a fixed rate connected to another with a synapse of unknown weight. You observe the output neuron is firing at half the rate of the input, but that doesn't mean the synapse has a weight of 0.5. 
it means the synapse weight is somewhere in the range of 0.5 on up to 1. Of course, within the simulator, you can just click on the synapse and read out its weight, or click on the neuron and see how much the synapse contributes to the membrane potential. But in a biological brain, the only way to measure the membrane potential is with needle electrodes, which is not a very pleasant prospect. Another impractical possibility toward learning a synapse weight is to add yet more neurons connected with known synapse weights and then do a little arithmetic on changing spike rates to find the unknown synapse value. But that presumes you can set a synapse weight to some specific known value, which is the second half of the synapse problem. Which brings us to how synapses learn their values. We've all heard that neurons which fire together wire together, which means that neurons with near simultaneous spiking increase a synapse weight while the converse is true. In this example, with clock connected to out with a learning or heavy in synapse, if we fire B to suppress the firing of out, the synapse weight will be lowered and you can see that out now fires slower. If we fire A to stimulate the firing of out, the weight will increase and you can see that out now fires faster. To recap, if we fire B, we can see that the synapse weight is weakened. If we fire A, the synapse is strengthened. But we never know precisely what the weight of the synapse is. With sufficient stimulation, you can be pretty sure that the synapse weight will be near 1, and with sufficient suppression, it will approach 0. In between, though, the synapse weights are imprecise. There is no way to set a synapse weight to any specific value like 0.5, and greater precision is even further out of reach. Finally, there is no way for the neuron to discover the precise weight of a synapse. So if you can't store or read back synapse weights, what good are they? Well, synapse weights are not useless, far from it. They are just useless for storing precise values you want to read back. Instead, a synapse represents a single bit of information, while the weight value represents the confidence that that bit is true. That is, how easily it can be changed. Once again, looking at the fundamental neural network formula, notice how it relies on the idea of precise synapse weights. Which brings us to backpropagation which represents a family of algorithms which need to be tweaked, trained, and tweaked again. Everyone can give examples of the shortcomings of backpropagation, like this one where facial recognition actually improves if parts of the face are rearranged, but is lost if the image is inverted. Further, you know your brain doesn't need thousands of training samples. You can learn a new symbol or a new face in just a few moments and you're not confused at all if it's upside down. But that's not my point. Backpropagation cannot possibly be representative of how neurons learn for two fundamental reasons. First, a quick look at the formula shows that it relies on knowing what current synapse weights are and being able to directly modify the weights of any synapse in the network with great precision. This is simply not possible in a biologically plausible world. Second, gradient descent will not work if the gradient field is not continuously differentiable, that is, if it isn't smooth, which it won't be because of the discrete nature of neurons and synapse weights in your brain. So biological neurons, synapses, and learning aren't like artificial neural networks. In this video, I've just scratched the surface of why AI doesn't represent the way your brain works. But that isn't to say that today's AI approaches are wrong or don't work. 
On the contrary, many AI systems work very well. It does mean that the algorithms of today's AI are different from the way your brain accomplishes the same tasks. And after 40 years of experimentation in AI with no emergence of general intelligence, it's time for some new approaches. I've used the Brain Simulator 2 to illustrate some of the capabilities and limitations of biological neurons, and I encourage you to download it and try it out. Introduce yourself to some biologically plausible neuron models and create some solutions of your own. If you agree with me that it's time for some new approaches in AI, please share this video with your colleagues, like, and subscribe. And once again, thanks for watching.